I know Bethany began last week with the series, and she actually um, had me adjust the series so that she could talk about oaths. <laughs> See, when you ask somebody to fill in for you, you have to do what they want. And, if they, <laughs> and Bethany said, oh, I want to do oaks. And I said, okay, well, really, that was scheduled for a week or two's time in my original schedule, so I swapped it around. And it wasn't a problem because, as you know, it was a subject very close to her heart and she was able to communicate uh, quite a good amount of information about oaks. But uh, what we have today is what we would have had last week if I were here. And we're going to talk about the subject of weeping willows. Weeping willows. Now, I have quite a history with these trees. I had one in my garden when I was growing up. And, of course, it became one of the first trees that I climbed. And, of course, consequently, one of the first trees I fell out of. As You knew that was coming, didn't you? You know, uh, as a child. And, uh, and then I also had one when I was an adult. The first house that I bought uh, had a nice big willow tree in the back garden. And had it not been for a big storm that came through and broke off several of the branches and made it look so hideous that I think ultimately they took it down. Uh, that would have still been there. But it, in fact, the road that I used to live on was named Willowwood because of the willows that were on it. And it was a lovely um, you know, name and a lovely kind of tree. But I want to share some facts about weeping willows. And then I want to bring some scripture into it that I think you will see instantly. Some of you will begin making the application just as I begin reading about the facts of the trees. You can pick out why God would be interested in these type of trees or why he created them. Weeping willows are rounded trees used in landscapes and along stream banks or in other areas that sometimes may experience long periods of light flooding or wet soils. They're not native to Europe, however. Weeping willows originated in China, of all places, and uh, were found along the ancient trade routes between Europe and China. The path of the introduction of the tree to Europe went through Southwest Asia to the Middle East, the tree was introduced to Europe in 1730, and it traveled from Europe to North America with colonization. Very interesting path. The geography, because the history of its spread, weeping willows are found, of course, in many parts of the world. They grow to between 30 and 40 feet tall and can reach 40 feet in spread. It's a very round tree. And it's a fast-growing tree. Weeping willows require full sunlight, regardless of the cultivator. Weeping willows can grow in a wide range of soils. Although they're drought-tolerant, they can also grow in wet soils, such as those along stream banks and lake shores. Native Americans, we, I grew up calling them Indians, uh, Native Americans used willows as medicine chewing young twigs and bark to alleviate headaches. You'll find out in a moment why they did that. Willow trees work well as single specimens or planted as a group used as a windscreen along the property line or other borders. Since the trees thrive in standing water, they help contain erosion by spreading their roots to slow the flow of water and reducing aeration. The tree provides temporary shelter and nesting habitat for birds and small mammals, but the fruits from the tree do not attract wildlife or birds. In the Bible, actually says in the Bible, Psalm chapter 137, and we'll look there in a few moments, in the Old Testament makes reference to the Israelites in captivity weeping, and hanging up their lyres on the branches of a willow tree by the waters of Babylon as they remembered their homeland. And according to legend, this caused the trees to weep or bend their branches over ever after. In English churches, willows sometimes stood in for palms for the commemoration of Palm Sunday. I didn't know that. 
From ancient times, weeping willows have been associated with death and mourning. The willow motif is sometimes seen on gravestones, especially during the Victorian period. Some mourners wore a willow sprig to signify their loss, and the willows are sometimes planted in cemeteries and were featured in art devoted to themes of death and mourning. The willow's ability to regrow from the top to cut off, uh, when the top is cut off, coupled with the ability of willow twigs to sprout readily, has given the tree an association with renewal and immortality in some cultures, including the Chinese. Now, this is the interesting thing about the medicine bit. Willows have been revered in many eras and cultures because the bark has been processed into herbal medicines to provide pain relief. In 1828, the active ingredient, salicin, was isolated from the bark, and this led to the development of modern-day aspirin. Isn't that interesting? Who would have thunk it that... Uh, <laughs> You know, the aspirin would come from a willow tree. But it's interesting, and there are so many parts of it. Of course, as I was reading this and received this information off the Internet, there's no mention in there of what the willow tree was used most frequently for in my growing up years, and that's when my grandmother used to break one off and use it as what she called a switch. Yeah. Right across the legs. Oh, it hurt. And it has a long, it's almost like a whip. So... You know, awful memories, but those days, of course, now are no longer. But when it comes to willows, it's so interesting when you begin to see that God's creation of these things and how they all fit and tell a story. There are verses in the scripture, and I don't have the reference to give you. Hopefully you'll know the verse that talk about creation showing forth the glory of God. We have so many things around us on a regular basis that tell us about God's character. Sometimes it's salvation. Sometimes it's about his healing powers. Sometimes it's about his emotions and his feelings. There's nothing wrong with believing that God is an expressive God. You know, we came through a culture, probably more in Victorian times, in America, I'm certain it would have surrounded Puritanic uh, times when emotions were uh, thought to be wrong and evil and needed to be hidden. And young people were brought up with uh, statements like boys never cry. And there were certain character traits about people that uh, were ingrained in us to make us feel that we should hide emotions. <laughs> And yet throughout the scripture, we find places where God actually expresses emotion. We have other times in the scripture where um, we are taught, of course, that God is our heavenly father. We pray this way, God, our heavenly father. And so we should. But the Bible doesn't say that God is exclusively male. God is a character of both male and female collectively together. There are some who went so far as to wanting to change the words to reflect it by saying our father, mother, God. And I think that's, that's not necessary to get the character around. What we have instead is the same character when God created man in Adam. He created man in his own image. When he created woman, he took part of man and created another being from man. But the man was complete. There are other places that talk about the angels being sexless and not having a gender because they're neither given in marriage or married. And the Bible says that those are complete beings in and of themselves. So to say that God doesn't have emotion is to rob ourselves of a huge part of the character of God. So when we see that, I look at the story uh, of, that we can learn about weeping willows, and I think there are some things that we can learn from this. Now, we looked at the verses in Proverbs chapter 11, and if you look in that with me, I just want to, again, begin by exploring some of the character traits that God portrays in the willow tree. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 1 the Bible says, the Lord abhors dishonest scales, 
but accurate weights are his delight. King James uses the word a false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. God <coughs> loves well-roundedness. There are other places in scripture that say that God made man upright. And there are those who say that he made him so he didn't hunch over. But he was talking about him being a well-rounded person. Somebody who has everything that they need in themselves as a human being. Yes, we are dependent upon one another. But God has created us in such a way that we have what we need to do what he wants us to do. So when it comes to these things, I read about the willow tree's characteristics and I read the fact that it's a well-rounded tree. I love the fact that it can grow as wide as it does tall. There is something wonderful about the fact that a willow can stand its ground and be as wide as it is tall. But there are other things that stick out as well. Did you notice that it followed the path of modern missions? I love that when it was expressing how the willow tree made its route from China into Europe and then into the colonization of America. And I thought, isn't that the path that the gospel took in its day and uh, how that the gospel began spreading that way? And I thought, is it such that God was sending an illustration of himself along the path of the gospel as it was propagated? It was just in passing. I thought about that. It's also fast growing. It's fast growing. Do you know, when I first became a Christian, one of the things that several around me in my church noticed was how quickly I seemed to latch on and want to get involved. Now, I know some of you, your testimony will be that it took you years. Some of you may have become Christian at a very early uh, year in your life and then may have done nothing for quite a while and then committed your life to Christ and began to grow. But um, for me, it's interesting because when I first became a Christian, I really took it hook, line and sinker. I mean, I just I, you know, I, I had the first opportunity that uh, our youth group said that I shouldn't be listening to some of the music that I was listening to as the lyrics were not healthy. I said, oh, well, then I'll get rid of them. And I broke 250 albums, you know, which was just a horror to many of my friends. They couldn't believe that I would do that. And I, I had many jokes at the time, like uh, I proved that Bachman Turner Overdrive's Not Fragile was fragile. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But there were many different things that I did because I had heard that I was supposed to do it. I wanted to respond to God's call in my life. I wanted to do what it was he wanted me to do. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to ponder it for many years. I just did it. And I'm not saying everybody's like that. And this is the interesting thing, because as we look at trees, we see examples of how God makes people. Not everybody is a willow tree. Not everybody is an oak tree. But each of the trees that God has made are in many cases very close to the character of man. As we continue to look at some of the character traits about Willow trees, many of you will see that there are some people who fit well into the mold. Some are fast growing. Some, within the, the context of a willow tree, they're both drought tolerant and flood tolerant. Have you had a good friend who, if it, times are getting bad or times are getting good, they just never leave you side? They just will be there no matter what. If there's nothing, they don't leave. But if there's too much, they don't leave either. They just stay there and they spread out and they guard you. There are other places where we read that they uh, lined the uh, banks and formed a windscreen as erosion protection. Have you ever had a friend who stood up for you, who protected you? from whatever it was that somebody might want to throw at you, 
who spread their roots out and sucked up a lot of the criticism that was aimed at you. And they stood between you and the critic. And they spread out and became as wide as they were tall. And you could hide behind them. But there are other places, as we read about the character, that says, but none of it is long term. Even the animals, the um, as our, our definition here said, even the animals, mammals, and birds don't nest in a willow tree. They don't find sustenance and their fruit and their, their food in a willow tree. Instead, it's a place to take temporary shelter. I was often taught as a child never to take shelter under a willow tree in a lightning storm because of how much water they absorb and how you know deep the roots and wide the roots go. It's a very dangerous place to take shelter <coughs> in the midst of a lightning storm because it would be very attractive to lightning. And of course, willow trees are frequently hit uh, above others by lightning. But they offer quite a strong protective sense. And it's interesting when we read that uh, their fruit don't provide sustenance on a long-term basis, but they'll be there for the temporary need. Let's look at Psalm 137. Turn back a few pages and let's see one of the places which the scripture talks about willow trees. In Psalm 137, now I'm just going to say instantly that uh, we have a bit of a conflict between the NIV and the King James because the NIV uses the word poplar trees and the King James uses the word willow tree. So I'm just going to read this and I'm going to insert the word uh, where it is translated willows in the King James. Verse 1, by the rivers of Babylon... We sat and wept when we remembered Zion. Verse 2. There on the, and then it, King James says, willows, we hung our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord? While in a foreign land. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy, remember, O Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is he for what you have done to us. He who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. It's interesting as we consider that these trees were representative of some place that the children of Israel wanted to hang their hearts, wanted to say, we are in a time of mourning because we have lost all of what was ours. We don't want to rejoice. We don't want to sing. And yet the enemies of the children of Israel, wanted to taunt them with their captivity, wanted to remind them of all of what they had lost, to explain to them that they would never be the strong people that they once were, but instead that they were now nothing but slaves and useless and worthless. I think often the enemy would have each of us get to a point in our life when we would forget our value when we would forget what it was that God had actually done within us to produce within us who we are and what we are capable of being able to do for him 
And there are times when we need to be reminded that actually our value is great. We need to be reminded that God has never forgotten his plan and his promise for us. And though the trees may have our harps, our lyres hanging on them, and our place of, uh, and our position in spirit is one of defeat and one of discouragement, God says, I want you to get the picture in your mind that this is only temporary. As the willow tree provides a temporary shelter, God says, I want you to realize that this need for weeping is really only temporary. And if it's cut down, if it's trimmed back, if it's wasted away, even a twig can cause it to grow back. Even something small and insignificant can cause a willow tree to once again sprout and begin to take root and spread its roots and grow to its height and grow to its width and provide its windscreen and provide its erosion protection. Live on very little and yet provide shelter when we need it. There's so much tied up in what God says about willow trees that we need to take note of. As a child, when I used to hang out in the willow tree, one of the things I enjoyed most was how low to the ground the branches were that allowed me to climb them. You know how it is when you see the big trees. I had a few big trees in my garden that I always wished I could climb, but I could never get to the first branch. They never would have been such that I would have been able to do. I mean, I suppose if I'd have thrown a rope over it, I might have been able to build a swing, you know. But most of the elms and oaks and things which I had uh, around the house uh, provided great shade, but they didn't provide any fun for a kid, you know. But the willow tree, the branches were right down to the ground. It was so easy to get up into it. It was so easy to, to get in and be sheltered. And that was the other thing I liked about the willow tree, is that when I was hiding the willow tree, nobody could see me. <laughs> the branches were so thick, the leaves and branches were so dense that I could hide in a willow tree and no one would know that I'm there. And there's nothing more fun for a kid than being able to be completely still and quiet when somebody walks past and then say something and have everybody wonder where you are. <laughs> and that was one of the great joys of being able to hide in a willow tree. But you know, there have been times in my life that I needed to hide. There are times in my life I wanted to just disappear I wanted to be able to get some place where I didn't have to be anybody else. I could just hide. I think we all get to a point sometimes when we are so beaten down that when the phone rings, we don't want to answer it. When someone comes to the door, we don't want to go and see who it is. Even if it's somebody we love, even if it's a relative or someone close, we just would prefer to hide and disappear. And I think God understands that. I think God actually makes room for us to be able to find temporary shelter at times in our life when we just need to be away from everything, when it's just all a bit too much. Sometimes I think we can get to a point, be it at school, be it at work, be it at home, when we wish we just could be alone and be able to be ministered to by our surroundings where we feel safe and secure. And I don't think there's anything wrong with those times. The only thing I do see from our lesson is the fact that I don't think that those times should be forever. You see, the danger is that we get to times when we shelter ourselves away from everything and we think, you know, I quite like this. I think I'll stay here. <laughs> uh, and you know the story of me having visited the monks and how that there is this um, community of isolation where they are away from the real world in many ways and completely isolate themselves from any outside influences. And it's incredibly refreshing 
to be able to get someplace where there are no phones, no televisions, no radios, yes, electricity and running water, but there's just such a simplicity about being able to go someplace so secluded. But it's usually after I've spent a week in a place like that that I can't wait to leave because I have an in born part of my personality that says I actually need people. I need communication. I need interaction. To be able to live, I cannot isolate myself forever. So keeping in mind the fact that sometimes coming out of those places are just as difficult as it is to sometimes find them and go into them. But it's necessary for our spiritual, mental, physical health to have interaction. There are times in our lives when we need protection. I have friends who have stood in the gap. I was, it was a time when I was in Stoke-on-Trent, I'll never forget. And uh, there were a bunch of lads who'd come up to the church who were actually part of a gang. And uh, they looked quite threatening, to be honest. And they'd come up and were congregating out in the car park. And, um, and so I thought, well, I better address this before it gets, you know, bad. So I walked out to the car park, and uh, it was on a Sunday um, after church, and I, and I wasn't quite sure what they were up to, or what they planned to do, but it didn't look good. It wasn't just them loitering. They actually had a plan of something was up. And so I came out there, and I, I, of course I engaged them in conversation, and uh, they did chat back to me. Uh, but I, I'll never forget, there was one guy in the church who was a, a bit of a bouncer. Do you know, he wasn't a bouncer, but he looked like one. You know? And he knew that. And so he came up, and all he did was stand next to me like this. You know, arms folded, staring. And he was by my side. So if I scooted a little bit to the right, he'd scoot a little bit to the right. All he was lacking was dark sunglasses, you know. To be, and I, but I, it made me smile later because I thought, regardless of whether it would have deterred anything, uh, and the situation was diffused and they ended up going home and nothing happened. But I thought to myself at the time, here was somebody willing to stand there and protect if it was necessary, you know, to stand in the gap. And I thought, that's, that's a lovely feeling, thinking that we have those people in our lives. And you know, they don't have to be tough people. They don't have to be bouncer type people. They can be, you know, uh, meek and, and mild. They can be um, quiet and shy. But if they're people who care and are willing to pray for you and be willing to do whatever it is that you need and, and step in and, and help take care of something that they know that you need, there's nothing like having those people there. Those are the willow tree people in your life. They come alongside you. They protect you. They're available to you. You can hide in them. You don't even have to have a reason to hide in them. Sometimes we just kind of need to shelter ourselves behind those who are the willow trees in our lives. And, and we don't necessarily always have to have a reason to do that. Maybe it's just to remind ourselves that they're there and that they care. Because having that reminder gives us the assurance that if we really did have a need, they would be available. Those are great friends. Those are the kind of people who stand in the gap. On the other hand, some of you are willow trees. Some of you are like that for others. Some of you are available when other people need you. Some of you are people that anybody knows that can come to you and hide, share with you anything, be able to just unload a burden full of information upon you, and actually you'll bear it. You'll be there. You'll be able to, 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 to protect them. And you know, sometimes it's funny because <laughs> there, I didn't tell you this part, but sometimes I hid in the willow tree after I'd done something wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, didn't, I purposely didn't tell you that part. You know, sometimes I ran to the willow tree and hid, not because I was innocent and wanted to get away, but because I'd done something wrong and I didn't want to be punished. And I knew I could run. And you know, sometimes we need places like that. 
Sometimes we need places that we can go, even when we've done something wrong, in order to be able to find shelter and understanding, to have somebody who will listen and says, yeah, you're right, you really shouldn't have done that. I really wasn't good, but I'm listening and I'm here. And if I can support you, and if there's anything that I can do to be with you during this time, I want to be here. You can hide in me. I'll be with you. I will be with you. When we have that type of person, when we are that type of person, people know that they can run to you even when they screw up, even when they know they don't deserve a friend. Have you ever been in a time in your life when you thought, you know, I don't deserve a friend. I don't deserve to have anybody side with me. In fact, everyone, if they knew, should be against me. Have you ever had times when you thought if they knew they wouldn't be for me, they'd be, they'd be coming down on me like I am myself. And yet we need the kind of person in our life who sometimes won't judge us. Because we need to judge ourselves, but sometimes we need a place where we can go where we don't have that kind of judgment against us. We have somebody who will just stand with us, who will hold our hand, who will be there and say, I'm with you, and I understand you've messed up, but I'm together with you. The Bible uses uh, a, a verse and talks about remembering those which are in bonds as if you are in bonds with them. There's no mention in that passage about the reason why the person is in bonds doesn't say if they're in bonds and they were innocent because chances are they weren't chances are they were put into bonds because they deserve to be in bonds but it does say that when they're in bonds we need to be there with them now there are other times and of course we know the apostles were incarcerated for reasons that they shouldn't have been but sometimes people in our lives are incarcerated for things that they should be incarcerated for and the Bible doesn't teach us that we are to ignore them and cast them out and throw them away. The Bible says we're to remember them that are in bonds as if we are bound with them, to be there for them. I remember visiting a man that I went to school with when he was arrested and thrown in jail. He was in uh, Bible college classes with me. And I remembered him quite well. And he was arrested in church on a Wednesday evening service. The police came in and arrested him, carted him off, took him away. Everybody was aghast, couldn't believe what has he done. And of course, everybody in the church believed so wholeheartedly that he was innocent. And uh, certainly he wasn't until proven guilty. But later he confessed that what he was being charged with, he was guilty of. Now, it was interesting to watch what the people did because so many of them at that point abandoned him. You know, he's lied to us. He's deceived us. He isn't any good. And I cast him out. And I don't think anybody really could blame them for the action that they took. But there were a few people who decided that no matter what he'd done, even if he was guilty, which he said he was, they still wanted to come alongside him and said, maybe now he needs us more than ever. And so they came alongside him and they supported him throughout his sentence. And when he came out, they helped him get his feet back on the ground. And within time, even though he had the reputation, even though he had the honesty to be able to say to everybody that he had committed the crime that he committed, was guilty of it, but it served his time. And he actually found a place within a church where he could serve again. And I don't know where he is today. I hope he's still doing well. But I thought about it at the time because it helped me fashion and form a character about myself. Which group of those people do I want to be? Which kind of people do I want to be? If one of you, <laughs> if I hear just how horrible you are, what you've done, what you, you know, are um, capable of doing. Um, is it going to be that I form in my mind this horrible opinion of you, disassociate with you, never want to see you again? Or do I find a magnetism 
about that character that says, actually, they probably need me now more than they've ever needed me before. You say, well, what is that like? Is that not the character of Christ? Is that not what Jesus did? Because, see, Jesus knows how bad we are. <laughs> he knows what we've done that is so undeserving of his love. And what we say often and believe wholeheartedly is that he loves us in spite of our sin. In spite of our sin, Christ died for us. He has shown his love, commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the Christ character that we need to take upon ourselves. It's very natural for us to be judgmental. It's very natural of us to be condemning of those who deserve condemning. It is very much part of our human nature to see evil and want to judge it. It's very Christian character of us to see and to forgive and to come alongside and minister to and be all that we can be. I'm not saying be foolish, but I'm saying that our hearts can be different than other people's when we make ourselves to be what Christ wants us to be. There are lessons we can learn from willow trees, many of them, and uh, I like the well-rounded part. I love the fact that they were fast growing. I love that they stand in the gap. And I love the fact that they are medicinal. <laughs> I don't know that you have any friends that you'd like to chew on. <laughs> but sometimes there are friends that we want to chew with. <laughs> you know, go out for a coffee, go out for a piece of cake and be able to, to, you know. But is it not true that there are times when we just need to talk with somebody and we find such relief in being able to share with other people the things that are going on with us? Is it not true that sometimes headaches can disappear even though we haven't taken anything for them just simply by releasing some of the burden that we bear? Is not a headache just pressure, both internal? And, and sometimes being able to just release that says, you know, I found great relief in being able to just talk to you, just be able to share and not have you judge me because I so expected that the moment I shared with you my issues, you would be as hard on me as I am on myself. Because you weren't, it helped me stop being. And so I suddenly just had a, a sense of peace. I think sometimes the character of God would surprise us at how much he understands about what we go through. How much he understands that we can't be holy in and of ourselves. We cannot be righteous in and of ourselves. We are completely and totally dependent upon Christ. The, the one in the temple who received the greatest from God was the one who in his exasperation smote himself in the breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He had nothing left. He could not plead and argue his point and say how much he was didn't he didn't deserve the, the condemnation and criticism of the one who criticized him. He deserved every bit of it. And all he did was say, you're right. You're right. I am all of those things. And God said, yeah, but I forgive you. And we see a different part of the character of God when we will be honest with him. We need to be honest with God. We need to be open with him. And we need to allow him to minister to us. Amen. Let's pray.